since we've talked about coherence and the need for the third slit, I'm going to go ahead and ignore the third slit now and just draw the two slits like this. And we can pretend that we have a perfectly coherent plane wave approaching those two slits. And we'll go from there. So Young's double slit, what we do is we have the light go through the slits and we ask ourselves what happens on a screen over here. So this is a screen. And the implication by calling it a screen is that light is going to be projected on the screen. So the question is, what does the light do? OK, so what you want to do is first define the separation of these two slits is A. And you wanted to define an axis right between the two slits. OK. Let's see. The distance from the slits to the screen we'll call S. OK. And then as you go up the screen, that's the Y axis. So if we come up here, plus Y. And the question is, what is the intensity pattern on the screen? We figure that out by just picking a point P and figuring out how much light ends up at P. What's the irradiance um, at point P? Okay. And we know what's going to happen if we believe in Helhun's wavelets, that when the plane wave hits this slit, the light, that little wavelet, acts like a spherical wave. And we have light coming out kind of like a spherical wave there and light coming out like a spherical wave there. And the question is, what are they going to do when they get here? And since this learning sequence is about interference, you know that they're going to interfere. But to start, we'll start with our approximations. Sometimes you apply the laws of physics, get some complicated equation, and you use approximations to simplify it. Sometimes you just start with the approximations, because you don't want to spend your time driving uselessly complicated equations. So one approximation we have to make is that the slits produce, I'll put spherical slash cylindrical EM waves. That's not the approximation, but let me just talk about that for a minute. If this is a hole in a round aperture type hole in a screen, it'll come out as a spherical wave. If it's really a one dimensional slit in the plane of the board, that's really what we're talking about, a slit in the plane of the board, it'll make sort of a cylindrical wave because there'd be a bunch of these little wavelets like this, and they're all, all going forward. It really doesn't matter because of the next sentence of our approximation. Let's see, it produces these cylindrical, spherically M waves, which you can approximate as plane waves far away, OK? So in addition to the plane wave solution to Maxwell's equations, there is a spherical wave solution of light just going out as a sphere, and there's a cylindrical wave solution, light going out as a cylinder. But if you get really far, then what you can say is, well, the curvature is going down. And if, if the wavelength is really short, and the curvature is going down, by the time you get out to here, if I were to draw a line from there to P, by the time you get to there, it pretty much looks like a plane wave. There's not much curvature to this circle. The radius is really big. If the spacing, the wavelength is really small, then you can kind of approximate it as a plane wave. So this is the case if this separation is much bigger than lambda, if this distance is much bigger than lambda. Or you could say, if we're going to define this as slit 1, that's r1. You could say if r1 is bigger than lambda. Same thing is going to happen here. So if I now draw a line from slit 2 to p, that's R2. It's going to make a plane wave headed to P. You could also, or it's going to make technically a spherical cylindrical wave headed to P, but if you're really far away, if R and S are much bigger than the wavelength, then again, you can treat it as a plane wave. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. Um, let's see. Now, if you do that, the E field amplitude. drops as 1 over r, um, if it's a spherical wave. Let's assume a spherical wave. It goes as 1 over r. 
So this is a problem because you see this one is going to create as a different distance. R1 and R2 are a little bit different, right? This one's a little bit further than this one uh, for P right there. So that would give them different amplitudes since it drops as 1 over R. Um, but since S is much greater than A, which I haven't told you yet, we have drawn it uh, not to scale. Really, you want to think of S as really far away and the slit is really close. So S is much greater than A. But since S is much greater than A, we're going to say that E naught 1 equals E naught 2 equals E naught. By the time you get all the way out here, the E field amplitudes have decayed from what they were in when the Howhans wavelet got them started, but they're pretty much the same. This difference in distance isn't significant. Or in terms of our interference formulas, we can say I naught 1 equals I naught 2 equals I naught. If you just square the E fields to get the amplitude or the irradiance, it's the same thing. Okay. Okay, so we're adding them up there. We're going to give them the same amplitude. Okay. Now you might go crazy and say, um, if S is a lot bigger than A, then maybe R1 equals R2. Okay? But you don't want to say that. Um, but S is not so much greater than A to make R1 equal R2. You don't want that, okay? This is not true, all right? Because if that were true, the interference would be easy. It's two um, plane waves just on top of each other. They just add. There wouldn't really be an interference effect. It's this difference in the path that we're going to see later that really creates the interference effect, okay? So this is an approximation we're not making, and I'm pointing it out because it's confusing. We say we're assuming S is bigger than A, so that has an effect on the amplitude. But we're not saying S is much, much, much bigger than A, such that R1 equals R2, because if R1 equals R2, there's no interference. Okay? So sometimes you make an approximation, but you don't go all the way with it, right? You only partially approximate, and that's just sort of um, uh, how it is. Let's see, so this is not true because we would lose interference. And if you don't know what I mean there, don't worry about it. We'll get to that in detail. We're going to draw why we get the interference um, in the upcoming boards. Okay, so that gets us started. We're going to keep working on this diagram and start to think about our interference pattern.